Thank you so much. Uh, such a pleasure to speak to all of you. And um, uh, I think Jeremy gave a great uh, introduction into some of the themes. Firstly, that there is a ton of heterogeneity in biology. So how can we make sense of all of this? You see this at all scales. If I look at brain networks, yours and mine, they look so different. Um, and, and there's also, of course, another big part of the puzzle is the randomness that we see in biological systems. If you go down to the cellular level, you see small numbers and fluctuations. And so given all of this heterogeneity and randomness, how does stable function emerge from the stochastic parts? Um, I absolutely agree with Jeremy that the million dollar question is dynamics. How do we get actually stable dynamics that emerge from all of this, um, from all of these complex interacting systems? For example, this is circadian rhythm or memory. You get um, these kinds of long-lived timescales like the circadian cycle that last for, for a long time, and yet they come out of much shorter um, transitions. And so here, um, I'm a theorist and I want to build models that allow us to describe how these uh, emergence um, behavior comes from these underlying components. And there's many different kinds of emergent behavior in biological systems. I mentioned already this global clock. Um, there's also on the, on, in looking at the cellular level, we see that there's uh, filaments in cells that grow and shrink stochastically that are important for cell replication or cell movements. And then of course, uh, different, um, you see synchronization on different levels, whether it's fireflies down to cellular cycles. And in here, these are all like very different behaviors. Uh, one characteristic that all of these have is that you have many parts here that act together to produce dynamics of function that's much more than the sum of each part that is essential for the for biological function. And I'm curious whether we can predict these global dynamical or functional states analytically. And here I'm going to show you today our stab at this, uh, which is that well, all of these systems look pretty different. I'm going to show that similar dynamics to all of these behaviors can all exist at the edge state of a topological phase. And so to introduce a topological phase, these are ideas that have been very developed in quantum systems. This is an electronic uh, conductor, it's two dimensional. And um, in the presence of this external magnetic field, the electrons make these closed cyclotron orbits. And in a the bulk, they don't go anywhere, they just move around, they're pinned locally. But on the edges, you see that they scatter off to form these chiral edge currents going in this direction on this edge and going in the other direction on the other edge. And this, and, um, this is a topological phase in a sense that you can see that the response is governed by its boundary because these bulk electrons are pinned and only these edge currents are what you measure when you, when you measure it. And topological phases are attractive because there is a sense of robustness. And that is that you can see that if you, if you were to deform this edge or you have some kind of blockage or perturbation, that then, then there will be a new edge that's formed and then this edge current will then go around the new edge. And so some kind of um, noise or disorder in the system does not destroy this edge current or this edge state, but somehow makes, um, um, just deforms or just moves the edge state around it. And so there's an idea of robustness, which is attractive because, you know, we started out with this idea that given all this uh, heterogeneity, randomness that's going on in biological systems, how is it that they still manage to execute their functions and their goals so efficiently? And we've also started to, um, other groups, uh, including ours, have started to develop some of these topological descriptions for stochastic systems. Oh, when, um, um, and you might think, well, how are these, how is a model like what you just showed me? This two dimensional model going to be useful for describing actual biological systems that are obviously three dimensional. And that is true if we think in real space, but if we think instead in chemical reaction space, we see that there's lots of motifs um, that could actually form um, um, networks that look similar to, to what I just showed you. One of which is um, for an, 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 a, a simple motif that is the futile cycle. And there are a lot of these motifs and cycles that often come about uh, through the consumption of ATP or GTP. And so these are very out of equilibrium transitions. And these futile cycles are so named because they consume energy and but yet seem to go right back to where they started. So why is it that it's, it's consuming all of this energy and to move back here. And yet these motifs are seen in many different biological systems, metabolism, sensory systems, protein synthesis, et cetera. And so we hypothesize 
that motifs like this could play a similar role to that of electron orbits that I showed you in the quantum Hall effects, where they, these electrons move around, don't seem to do anything. And similarly, there can be chemical reactions that form cycles that may seem to be futile, but instead within a larger network, they could support edge currents or directed activity on the edges of this chemical reaction space. So to illustrate this idea, I'm going to um, show you a, a simplified model. This is a polymer model. And um, now you're, after Jeremy's talk, you're used to looking at how polymerization. So um, in here, this is a polymer model. We have two types of monomers, the purple monomer and the green monomer. The numbers of each are given in this bracket. So the first um, um, number is the number of purple and the second number is the number of green monomers. And these, um, mon these polymers can grow and shrink in both the purple and the green space um, with these transitions. And of course, for a given monomer configuration, then the system can have four possibilities. It can grow um, and or shrink in the purple or in the green space. And so we allow for a, for a tag of of the system that then tells the system. So the A tag tells the system, now you can add a green. The B tag tells the system, now you add a purple. Here you remove a green, here you remove a purple. And um, this then gives rise to a, to a state space that has three, um, in, three indices, the X and the Y and this internal tag. So that then for each monomer configuration, there are these four internal states, A, B, C, and D. And we also can allow for transitions between these internal states of the same configuration. And all of this can be laid out as a lattice, uh, where here we have these uh, four internal states can um, then form the unit cell uh, um, as like in this blue box. And then this X axis here describes the growth of the purple monomer. And here this Y axis describes the growth of this green monomer. And this loop that I described up here of transitions is exactly this loop um, up here and then this it loop between these internal transitions forms this loop down here. And so it's just writing it as a lattice is just a way of, of, of laying out the different transitions in a, uh, another way. But this lattice um, picture is very useful because it then allows us to see um, some things and in particular when we can get the topological transition. So in general, if we don't really specify anything about these rates, let's say if they are about these, if these solid rates and these gray rates are about the same, then the system will just form a random walk. Um, and that you can see that it kind of just moves around and it can just um, go around the system um, because there's these cycles that are going in opposite directions. And so in time, we'll just ergodically explore the entire network. But instead, in the topological phase, and that's the condition that this black rates are faster than these gray rates, then the system, once it wanders to the edge, it will stay on the edge in that uh, regime. And you can see it by inspection. So let's say we're here, and here we can only move forward. And here these black rates are faster than these gray rates. We will be likely to move forward. Here we can only move forward. Here we're likely to move forward. We can only move forward. Here we'll round the corner and we'll keep going around the edge. And so here there is the first thing that, that in this topological phase, the system, um, even though there's all these possible uh, different uh, states, but the system instead forms this very directed behavior and that's going. Um, in, in a very ordered uh, particular sequence that stays around instead the edges of the space. And so this dramatically uh, reduces the phase space or redu reduces the effective dynamics of the system. The other property that, that, that we can see that, that these models also inherit this robustness, which is that now here, let's say we have um, some obstructions or some inaccessible states. And instead of then, uh, usually when there's obstructions to, to some kind of process that will destroy the edge state or, the, or destroy the response of the system. And instead here, what happens is that you can see that the system then just rounds the corner and then it's going to round this corner as well and, and it's going to go around the new edge of the system such that it always maximizes this phase space that it can form. And so this is something that we're interested to see how these directed currents could describe directed processes in biology. Of course, there are many. And one thing that's also useful about this model is that because here we have essentially two parameters, uh, um, the black uh, rate and then this gray rate. And so then this is also can then allow us to provide predictions that can be used to compare to experiments. Um, because a lot of times what is difficult uh, in this process of comparing with experiments is that often we have so many parameters in our model that it's not easy to actually identify uh, changes in which uh, changes of which parameters will then give rise to the sort of behavior that we would like to see. 
So now let me show you uh, one example about how this could be relevant for a biological system. So you can see that this forms this large global cycle around the edge of this uh, chemical reaction space. And so this can form this large oscillator um, or also a sort of a clock. And so we we're curious whether this could describe um, a biological clock. And there are many biological oscillators of different periods. And one very well studied one is that of the Chi ABC system that regulates the circadian rhythm of cyanobacteria. And here, um, this Chi ABC system is a group of um, monomers that form this hexamer system. And here, uh, what we have is that these monomers have two phosphorylation sites, the T phosphorylation site and this S phosphorylation site. And to, um, and to govern or to, or to create this 24 hour cycle, what happens is that is this a sequence of sequential phosphorylation. So at first all of the T sites on the hexamer get phosphorylated, all of the S sites get phosphorylated, and then all of the T sites on the, phosphor on the, on the hexamer get dephosphorylated, and then all the S sites get dephosphorylated. And so this is this very concerted uh, cycle. And of course, there's many other um, things that are happening. For example, there's uh, changes in conformation. You can see that these A loops that are sticking out can be exposed or they can be buried in here. It can be binding of this Chi A or Chi B um, other proteins as well. And so there's a, actually a very large phase space of possible transitions. There can be phosphorylation, there can be conformational change, um, there can be binding of different things. And so with all of this very large phase space of transitions, why is it that this global cycle of phosphorylation um, happens in this particular concerted way? Why is it in fact so robust? And, the mis and it's even more mysterious if we look closely um, at what we know of the biochemistry. And so the monomers can assemble into hexamers and disassemble into back into monomers. They um, are, are, are um, surmised to have their own phosphorylation and dephosphorylation loops. Monomers can also shuffle in between different hexamers and even within the same hexamer. Um, it was recently uh, shown in this um, very recent cryo-EM data that monomers can actually have different conformations within the same hexamer. So some monomers can have an exposed conformation and some of them can have a buried conformation. And so given this huge phase space of different monomer transitions that they seem to be able to um, do their own thing of conformational change or phosphorylation, why is it that instead um, they all phosphorylate in this constituted way, which then gives rise to this 24 hour clock, but what is the biochemistry that actually allows them to do that? And so here um, um, we propose a theoretical model that can help to answer this. And in this, in, in this model, what we have here is that now our X and Y axes are the T phosphorylation and S phosphorylation respectively. And here I'm showing uh, with the addition of this yellow small yellow circle and with the addition of this uh, small pink circle. And, um, and this is a particular phosphorylation dephosphorylation cycle of A monomer. And then as we had before, then for the same phosphorylation configuration, we can also have internal states um, between the different tags that tell the, that are then telling the system which transition can happen next. And these internal transitions can be changes in conformation, such as going from the exposed state to the buried state of a, of a monomer, where now I'm showing the exposed as a diamond and the buried monomer as um, a circle. Or these internal transitions can be facilitated, facilitated by the binding of chi A or chi B. And this is exactly the same model as what I just showed you. Um, is, is these four states, but now our state space goes from zero, zero to six by six um, because we have six monomers in this hexamer. And then, and in this model, in the topological phase, which is when these um, black rates are faster than these gray rates, then the system will then stay on the edge. And so, um, so then that means that these hexamers will then undergo all the T sites phosphorylating, all the S sites phosphorylating, all the T sites dephosphorylating, and all the S sites dephosphorylating. And so in here, we have a model in which we don't have to uh, ignore or we can still retain all of these individual monomer transitions that are believed to exist. And, uh, and yet the system, um, because of this of, the, of our particular topological layout, then naturally gives rise to this large edge cycle that gives a sequential phosphorylation that is seen in experiments. And um, this is something that um, estab the established model in the literature uh, they do talk about these large cycles, but often it's difficult to justify why these intermediate states in their model would then be negligible, which is an assumption that they have to make. So 
Um, th that is a model. I just want to um, illustrate just three slides on um, how we can just understand a little bit about the topology and that's and then theory that's that's giving rise to these um, dynamics on the edge of the system. So these are systems that are described by the master equation where P is this probability vector that has all of the different um, um, this all of the state space in the system and W is the transition between the different states. So all of those arrows that I laid out in the lattice then goes into this W. And in fact, precisely because our W can be laid out as a lattice, then that actually allows us to calculate um, a topological invariance of that system. In um, Specifically, we can then calculate the Berry connection. Um, and this connection between the Berry connection the, um, of a particle that lives in a lattice was suggested by Zach um, several decades ago. And the Berry connection is typically calculated from the eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian is this H that obeys the Schrodinger equation. And here we are exploiting this correspondence where you can see the Schrodinger equation is identical to the master equation, just up to an I. So what this means is that if we then map our master equation into a corresponding um, Schrodinger equation, then this then um, W will have identical eigenvectors because this constant is not going to change the eigenvectors as a corresponding Hamiltonian in the Schrodinger equation. And therefore, since the Berry connection is calculated from the eigenvectors, we can simply calculate the eigenvectors um, of W as well. And this is a schematic that's um, trying to show how an eigenvector um, can um, evolve in reciprocal space. And so here you can see that that here that this reciprocal space is periodic and goes from uh, minus pi to pi. And if this uh, wave, if this eigenvector winds around um, in this uh, reciprocal space, then it is topologically, um, then, then it is topological. And more specifically, essentially, if we look at um, a particular metric obtained from the eigenvectors and we look at the integration over reciprocal space, if we obtain zero, then the system is trivial, which means that it will not particularly favor the edge, that it will just spend equal amounts of time in the, in the bulk versus the edge. But if integration over reciprocal space yields pi, then the system is uh, something non-zero, then it, it is topological. And then the, there will be edge states that are the dominance response of the system. We can also just directly simulate this without having to think about the theory. We can just simulate the master equation using the Gillespie algorithm. What we can see here is that the system goes around the edge. Um, it's probably easier to see um, the initial start in this um, um, video in which, oh, sorry, in this in this um, um, graph in which here, this is the XY plane of our network. And you can see that initially this and, and, and time is the vertical axis. And you can see that initially the system just forms this random walk in the XY plane until it hits the edge. And once it hits the edge, it's going to keep going around the edges of this reaction network. So much so that in a long time limit, then the system will then um, stay on the edges um, of the system. I can also see this by directly solving for the master equation, where we see that these, um, we see that indeed the system, um, the, 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 the ground state of the system or the, um, um, the longest lift mode does stay on the edges. And in fact, further analysis shows that these edge states are exponentially localized on the edge. And so they exponentially decay um, into the bulk of the system, which is actually uh, very handy because then it allows us to see that this, these edge states can remain robust even in fairly small systems of just a few um, um, molecular uh, sizes. Because here, even if you have a small system, now that these edge states are exponentially localized, that they will not bleed into each other, but that we can still have edge states that go around the edges even in fairly small system sizes. So we can use these for even system sizes as small as a handful of molecules all the way to thousands of molecules. So um, that was the th some of the theory that underlies these systems. And I'm just going to take um, a few minutes just to show how a couple of other um, um, uh, dynamic uh, biological systems that these ideas could be useful for. So here um, I'd shown you I'd shown you this four state system. Here we we also have a three state system in which now here um, it's it, our x axis is still the number of um, subunits or the number of um, 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 monomers in this system, and then the y axis can be their conversion. So let's say they are being um, converted from um, a GDP bound monomer to a GTP bound monomer. 
And then, um, so here you can see that, so then this would be conversion, this would be growing of this monomer, this would be removal of this converted monomer. And again, we have for each, for each configuration, there's three different possibilities that um, it can happen. Um, that, that whether it's whether it's conversion or addition or, or, or removal. And so these three states can then form the internal states. And then we can also have transitions between the internal states. This can still be laid out uh, now as a lattice. This is a Kagome lattice, where now we have these uh, three states that can then tile uh, the space where now this x-axis is growth of this monomer chain. This, um, um, this, this, this um, side here is conversion, conversion of that monomer chain, and this is removal of the converted um, chain. We can again verify that this system will then um, display edge currents, as we can see by just uh, simulating this or solving for the master equation. So now what we have here is that we have this three-state system, which has three black rates and three gray rates. And of course, in biology, it's very complicated. There's often many more rates. So let's change one of the rates and see what we get. And so here I'm changing the upper right rate so that it is now faster than these um, than its other gray rates, but not as fast as these black rates still. So what that will what we expect is that then the system will then be slow on this growing edge and will be fast um, because now now these um, circle gray rates are faster. It will be fast on this converting edge and then will be slow again when it shrinks uh, after conversion. So we plot just this growth and shrinkage then we expect to see, um, this, is, this is what we do expect, it grows and then it converts quickly and it shrinks, so it grows and shrinks. And then we also see these points in which sometimes you see that it doesn't make it all the way to, to, to the top. And what's happening here is that now the system, it doesn't make it all the way to the edge because these are faster. So sometimes it, it cuts out, it cuts out in these smaller triangles. And that's what we are seeing here. <clears throat> and this is, um, you know, still quite preliminary data. And uh, but what is intriguing is that already we see that this is reminiscent of the stochastic inst um, dynamic instability of microtubules, where, the, where microtubules, instead of growing all the way to the same length every time, they grow to different heights and then they shrink um, um, at different heights. And it's not easy to describe this theoretically. And so here we see that just with three parameters, um, this, the black, the gray, and the intermediate gray, we cannot see a pattern that's similar to what this complicated uh, system is doing. And it's definitely something that we would love to uh, explore more. So lastly, um, because we're thinking about chemical reaction space, it's of course possible to start to couple systems together. Um, for example, let's say we have two systems that are um, polymerizing by drawing from the same pool of monomers. So let's say now here, the pool of monomers is capped by the length of this x-axis. So once one um, system starts growing from the left towards the middle, the other one starts growing from the right towards the middle. And uh, once they um, meet, then they will have consumed all the monomers in the system and they have to move to the next reaction. And so one thing that you can see is that then they move up along this shared edge that is actually dynamical because it, it's, it's um, stochastic. So it changes every time, which is something that we don't have in solid state systems or quantum systems. And then the other thing you can see is that after a while they start to, because of this competition, they start to show this um, um, anti-phase synchronization that you can also see here um, in this probability uh, density plot. And this is, of course, that's a large phase space that we haven't fully explored yet, but initial exploration has already also shown us that we can also obtain in-phase synchronization by looking at some different parameters. So I think it's, um, and now I'm just going to zoom out a little bit and just to say that these, um, that now theoretically we also have many interesting questions because um, here this W of this master equation is non-symmetric because we have these out of equilibrium or very directed transitions. And this is definitely a challenge for physics because so much of our topological theory or theories are developed for energy conserving systems, systems in equilibrium or Hermitian Hamiltonians. Whereas now biology definitely provokes us to develop new tools for non-reciprocal interactions that are the norm in biology. And just mathematically or theoretically, already when we start looking at these non-Hermitian systems, we see some new features that, we, that are not present um, or cannot be present in Hermitian systems. For example, that eigenvalues can wind around in a complex plane, or we get singularities now in which the system becomes actually um, singular. And, and just to contrast this with Hermitian systems where in a level crossing system, it still has a full basis and it's not singular. So now there's uh, different singularities, square root branch points and other interesting um, things. 
So um, I think I'm more or less at time. So I'm just going to skip the summary. I'm just going to say that my, in my group, we love thinking about emergent phenomena across scales. Today I talked about topology, but we've also thought about brain networks and control and learning as well as uh, information propagation and fluids and other systems. I want to thank my collaborators, Jaime, um, where I'm in director of my department, uh, formerly. And now here at Rice, we are um, starting our group. And so um, we also have students and postdoc positions available. And I'll leave up the summary here. Uh, well, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, great, thank you, Evelyn. Uh, we do have a few questions from the audience. Uh, John, uh, it's a long uh, question. Would you like to come up and uh, ask it yourself? Can I sure, yourself? yeah. Uh, this was uh, a bit from the earlier part of the talk, so, so some of it came up. But um, if I understand correctly, these edge currents are not strict, but just depend on the ratio of the reaction rates. And mm -hmm. exactly. I was wondering if there was some kind of criterion like edge lifetime versus sort of random walk from the interior that one would compare to come up with a criterion, whether something is being topological or in that regime or not. Absolutely. Yeah, your picture is exactly right. So um, the ratio is important and the closer they go to each other, the more that, um, uh, so, so, so long as the black is larger than the gray, then they will start to spend more time on the edge. But you know, if it's only a little bit larger than the gray, it will just spend a little bit more time on the edge. And We'll stay on the edge and then it will come back into the bulk, of course. So it will unbind and then it will find its way back to the edge. So yes, there is definitely an edge lifetime or an expected sort of maybe coherence before it loses um, this edge. And this is something that's very interesting to compare, for example, in oscillators or other systems, how coherence is this, of course. And, um, and uh, so you're yeah, absolutely right. Do we need the edge? You asked also, do we need the edge lifetime larger than the random walk time? Um, I think there's different... Um, um, one maybe you could say that if you were looking at you know a very short time, um, but I think if we start looking at the steady state and we start looking at statistics, then we can see that um, um, that on average the system will spend more time on the edge, and so then we can also just look at what is the total amount of time spent on the edge versus um, you know doing a random walk, and so that's I would say that there's two different ways to compare. I suppose there is the sort of you know, literal how long before it unbinds versus, um, um, yeah, versus sort of on average what happens, if that makes sense. But we can discuss this more. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great observation. Uh, good. Uh, um, we have a question from, uh, ah, Jean Maria, the question was asked. Emil, uh, Emil Prodan has a question. Uh, do you like to ask it? Yes. Uh, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, the question is how or what determines the edge of the system? Yeah, so this would be the, the, the chemical, um, you know, the, the, the um, number of molecules or the number of transitions. So in the chi ABC system that I mentioned, that was determined by the size of the hexima. So there are six monomers in the system. So then the system goes from zero, zero to six by six. If it's instead a monomer that's growing, um, normally the length of the monomer would determine that. And that can also be, of course, something that may not be a hard boundary, that it may be something that, you know, it grows uh, more, uh, more, more softly, which is, again, that's something that's new that we don't have in quantum systems, um, but something that sort of gradually um, goes up. But most chemical systems and biological systems, there is a finite size to it. And so actually, this is a great question because the question about size and what determines size is a big question in biology in general. So um, this is something that is also definitely then would be what we would use to uh, model the system, but it's also interesting to think about the converse. How can our model also help us understand what goes into the size determination of a particular system? But yeah, why does but it grow until that particular length and stop, right? In, 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 some, in some of the slides, you show some intricate uh, boundaries. Uh, those are just for, uh, how will those come up, for example? Yeah, that's a good so You show point. a Mickey Mouse boundary. How will that come up? <laughs> so that can come up by, a, by some different ways. One of which is that even if the system is fairly regular, but if you have impurities or you have blockages, let's say some reactions are not available, you have a lower concentration at that particular time, then the system may then dip into that boundary, right? So then uh -huh. we may get a Mickey Mouse boundary just because of the stochasticity that's inherent in the system. But then maybe the system can still 
you know, complete its its currents or whatever it needs to. So there can be different reasons why one may have um, certain certain um, shapes. I mean, biology is complicated, so I wouldn't <laughs> okay. I wouldn't I wouldn't discount the, the possibility of getting Mickey Mouse boundaries in a, in a biological system. Thank you.